We are just delighted to be here with you today to tell you more about this grant program and um, to uh, give you some tips for applying. I should say at the outset that we will share this recording with everyone who registered for the webinar. So don't worry if we don't catch all the information, that will be emailed to you next week. So we've got a four part agenda for you today. I will start by giving you a brief overview of the foundation's research priorities. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Melissa, who will tell you about the basic parameters of the Scholars Grant Program. And then she'll turn it back over to me and I will offer some tips for developing a strong application. And then we'll end um, with a Q&A session. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to go ahead and type out your questions throughout the session. So you certainly don't need to wait till the end. Go ahead and type them into um, the uh, box that you have. We will be following those questions as it goes on and we'll just hold our answers until the end of the webinar. So with that, um, Billy, would you get us started? There we go. Okay, the foundation has uh, two research priorities. Um, overall, the mission of the foundation is to support research to improve the lives of young people in the US. Um, we define the age range uh, that we're interested in as five to 25. So five, you can think about as um, traditional entry into elementary school, 25 as a marker, um, sort of a capping off young adulthood. Um, our two research priorities are first, to um, better understand programs, policies, and practices to reduce inequality in youth outcomes. Um, and this is really, the word reduce inequality is really important here because in the social science uh, research community, we do a lot to understand the problem of inequality. And when it comes to research on inequality, most of the research we have is understanding the problem of inequality. So there's a lot of research on the causes, consequences, correlates, um, of inequality. And our focus is less on understanding the problem, although that's very important. Our hope is that to take the research and what we know about the problem of inequality to study ways to reduce inequality. And so we're interested in research that builds, tests, increases our understanding of ways to reduce inequality in youth outcomes. Um, because our interest is in inequality, it goes without saying that applicants should make a good case that there is currently an inequality in youth outcomes and be quite specific about that and be specific about the dimensions of inequality that they're interested in. We have called out a particular um, interest in racial ethnic inequality, socioeconomic inequality, and inequality related to immigration status or language minority status. Um, so really develop a good case for the fact that there is an inequality and bring a strong theoretical and empirical rationale to the table of how your particular study would reduce, or inform, I should say, inform policies, programs, and practices to reduce inequality. Our second research interest is improving the use of research evidence in policy and practice. And this goes back to um, our general mission. Our mission is supporting research to improve the lives of young people. And we can't do that, fulfill that mission, unless the research is informing policy and practice to affect the lives of young people in the US. So we're interested in turning that into an empirical um, area of study. So we're interested in studies that examine um, how to make research more useful, perhaps through things like research practice partnerships or co-production, or in research on how to improve the use, the actual use of research evidence. And we're interested in research that examines when and how, when and how and under what conditions does using research evidence actually lead to improvements in youth outcomes? Because it's rarely um, a straight linear path and improving the use of research and decision making to actually improving down road outcomes. So we're interested in when and under what conditions it's likely to happen. Um, I welcome all of you if you're interested um, in 
learning more about the foundation's research priorities to go to our website. Um, if you go under research grants on improving use of research evidence or research grants on reducing inequality, and you go to a particular subsection called resources for applicants, you'll find a lot of materials there, including blog posts that have been written by program officers, giving people a better understanding of what we're looking for in applications. You'll find recommended readings of the things that uh, the grantees that we have funded have written in these two focus areas. You'll also um, see blog posts and things that they've written sort of as another way of describing um, the findings that have come out of their work. So we're not going to spend too much time on that because a lot of that information can be found on our website. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. Thank you, Vivian. And so now that you have um, a little sense for what the foundation's priorities are overall, we wanted to dive more into the particulars of the scholars program. And we're going to start by just giving you a sense of who's eligible and what the goals of the grant actually are. And so thinking about in terms of who's eligible, the scholars program is really geared towards early career scholars. And so what that actually ends up meaning in practice is that we're going to add, um, we're focused on those of you who have earned your doctorate within the past seven years. And so in practice, we're actually gonna add seven years to your earned degree. If you have an MD, we're going to add seven years to the point at which you completed your first residency. And so really targeting people at an early stage of their career where there's the possibility to grow and expand in different ways. We are focused on people who are in career ladder positions. For those of you who are in a faculty role, it's usually easy to think about that as a career ladder. You know, you start as an assistant, move to an associate, then to a full. However, we do want to emphasize that we um, that people who work outside of faculty positions are also eligible. What would be important to think about whether or not you fit within a career ladder position. Um, a few things to have at the top of your mind are if you're working on a project and your relationship with an organization ends as soon as the grant ends, that's not a career ladder position. And so what we're looking for is trying to figure out if the organization is invested in your long term growth and long term stability within a particular role. And so as a um, general rule, people who are working at places like MDRC or RAND, they're eligible. Again, they have that career progression in research. But if you have any questions about your particular case, that would be a moment to talk with an administrator at your organization or to potentially um, be in contact with me or Vivian or others at the foundation who you might know to figure out, you know, here's what's going on with me. Does that fit within this idea of a career ladder position? In terms of how many applications we actually accept from any one institution in a given year, we accept one per college or division. And so with that in mind, we can accept application, multiple applications from one, say, university, but it does have to be clear that those applications are coming from different entities within the within the uh, university. And so at my former institution, we had a College of Social Behavioral Sciences and a College of Humanities and Fine Arts. And so we could get applications from both of those because they had a clear differentiation in terms of their dean structure and those sorts of things. And so that would be fine, but receiving two applications from the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences doesn't fit within our parameters. Um, and so again, that can be a question that you could give to a program officer, to me in email, if you have any questions about, well, is this really a separate division or not? What the scholars program is really invested in is developing um, a particular uh, scholar's career. And so we invest as a foundation in your career development and growth over the course of five years. You're eligible to apply for up to $350,000 for this award. But in thinking about investing in a scholar's career, that is slightly different than an investment in a particular research project. And so we are interested in funding people so that they can actually expand their expertise. Um, people might be looking to expand 
their research expertise, you know, pick up some new methods. You might also be interested, say, in expanding your um, theoretical expertise. You're primarily located in political science, but you think it might be useful to draw on sociology or history to expand your research. Um, and so, but the general idea is that we're interested in more than just the particulars of a project. We're interested in helping to fund the development and expansion of a career. Now, that being said, it is important that the uh, stretch that you imagine taking, so those new methodological or theoretical tools that you imagine taking on do have to be realistic. And so um, it's less likely or say slightly less realistic that you're a psychologist and you're gonna say at the end of five years, I'm gonna be a sociologist. Um, that's slightly less likely and realistic when we're thinking about reviewing the application. What's more realistic is I'm a psychologist. I'm interested in studying educational inequality. And I think there are some tools from sociology that can inform the way I both think about this theoretically and also analyze this methodologically. And I think over the course of five years, if I'm able to uh, have this investment, draw on those theoretical and methodological traditions, I will be in a better position to produce research that helps us understand at a policy or practical level how to reduce inequality in youth outcomes. Um, in order to, again, make the case about how this investment in your career will allow you to expand, it's important that you um, talk about both your research goals within your application and how mentors will help you get there. And so mentorship is a big part of this, again, investment in your career growth. And so scholars have to choose one to two mentors and have to talk about how those mentors will help them stretch, grow, and expand. And so that's a really important component of this grant program. The foundation also makes investments in your expansion and growth as well through um, a couple of different um, programs. We have an annual scholars retreat. And so all the scholars gather once a year at the end of June to connect over their research, to present in front of one another. We invite members of the selection committee, which I'll talk about in a moment. We invite um, people who are sort of known for doing work that's connected to improving youth outcomes as experts and consultants to the retreat. And so um, that's, again, a way that the foundation is hoping to provide a context where you can interact with your peers interact with people who are a little bit further out in their career as well and who are sort of like the leading experts in the field so that again you can grow and strengthen um, in the topic area that you're pursuing. We also have other engagements. So we have a conference that uh, looks at mixed methods. Um, we have different um, research convenings on our priority areas. And whenever we offer these um, sorts of engagements, scholars are welcome to attend and encouraged to attend so that you can pick up new skills, make new connections as well with others within the field. And so in terms of the review process and what that looks like, applications are due in early July. Um, the deadline for this year is actually July 6th. That being said, I do want to point out that things like reference letters, nomination letters, um, and a few other components are actually due in June. And so the earlier that you actually go to our application portal, which opens in April, and start to get a sense for the different dates and the different components that are due, the better you'll be served in this process. Um, but the bulk of your application that you're responsible for is due in early July. Once you actually submit an application, it goes through several rounds. The first round is when senior staff, so me and other staff members at the foundation um, review it. There are two um, reviewers per application. We screen the applications initially for their completion as well as for their fit with our priorities and for the promise um, of the application. At this stage, about one third of the applications are screened out. If you advance from this stage, you move to the selection committee review portion of the um, process. 
at that point, you receive two in-depth committee reviews from our selection committee members. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a moment, but the selection committee members um, span various disciplines. And so they're able to bring that interdisciplinary perspective to any given application. Once the um, selection committee reviews your applications, they then meet to actually select 10 finalists. Once you get to the finalist stage, um, your application actually undergoes a, another round of reviews. We send it out for two external reviews who have particular expertise, either in the methodological or theoretical area in which you're working. After those um, reviews come in, then finalists are actually invited um, in non-pandemic times to the offices of the foundation in New York. In pandemic times, finalists have been invited to the foundation Zoom in order to actually um, do an interview in front of the selection committee where they are given the chance to respond to both the selection committee reviews as well as the external, um, uh, external reviews as well. And after that stage, um, then um, typically between four and six um, applicants are awarded um, an actual grant, awarded a scholar's grant. And so here's the selection committee. I think that this was actually the first picture like post vaccines within the pandemic um, that's across from the foundation. So the foundation is located um, across from Grand Central Terminal for any of you who are familiar with New York. And so those are the people who will be reading your applications and we can go, yeah, thank you. And so here are the names of the selection committee members. Their names and affiliations are on our website. And what you'll notice if you go to the website and see their affiliations is that, again, they come from a number of different disciplines. And that's really important in thinking about how do you write your application. You want to write your application in a way that does illustrate, you know, your depth and knowledge of a scholar, but you have to be careful that you don't draw too much on any particular jargon from your discipline because people who will read your application in those earlier stages, they have to be able to understand what you're doing. And so thinking about how do you talk about what you're doing in a way that scholars across disciplines can understand it is a really important thing to have at the top of your mind. Um, and so that actually gets us a little bit into thinking about the tips for the applications. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Vivian so that she can dive a little bit more deeply into that subject. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I already see some questions in the um, in the uh, sort of chat box that um, addresses some of the points, some of the questions we're going to be answering these tips. One is, um, should you apply? Um, and there's various ways in which people are wording that in their own question. I would say this is a very long application with a lot of components to it. So this is not the easiest grant application to pull together. Um, and so I, I would recommend that people think really hard um, about the fit of their research interests with the foundation's priorities. Um, and so really take some time to look at the foundation's priorities on reducing inequality or improving the use of research evidence. Um, it's often the case that we can tell when someone has a different interest and they're kind of trying to shape it and reshape it to fit the foundation's interest, and it very rarely comes across well. Um, it's like a, a, a square peg trying to be hammered into a round hole. So we really encourage folks to, to take a good look at our priorities and see how well they map onto what your interests are for five years of research. That's a long time, too. Um, and if there is a good fit, then yes, we would encourage you to apply. Also think hard about whether this program's goals fit with your goals. Um, this is a career development grant. Um, it's not the grant to conduct your next study. So if you, if you really have a clear research trajectory and you have the next logical study you want to con conduct that kind of builds very um, incrementally and carefully upon your prior research, but there's no really big stretch goals for you with expanding your expertise, then probably what you're looking for is a research grant, um, which is not focused on career development. Um, so think hard about whether you really want a career development grant um, and all that goes along with it. 
five-year program of research and five years. Another question we're asked is, when should you apply? Um, so if you think again that you have to develop a five-year program of research, it's often challenging for folks who are just coming out of their PhD to be able to do that. Um, often people need a few more years out to really build a body of work behind them to think about what are the next big steps that I want to take to expand my, my research program. And so I would say um, usually people who are four to seven years out are often better positioned and more competitive for the grant program. Um, that's not an iron clan rule. So certainly people who are um, earlier um, in their careers have applied and been successful. But I would say the medium person is probably closer to the mid to later parts uh, of this range. Um, the other question we're often asked is about resubmission. Um, and we want to say this very clearly. We encourage resubmissions um, if you think, again, that's a good fit with the foundation's priorities, a good fit with the foundation's goals for this scholars program. Resubmission of grants is normative. Um, that's not to say everyone who resubmits gets the grant. That's not the case. But on the flip side, many of the people who do get the grants have gotten it on resubmission. And I think it's easy to see why that is. Um, if you go through the process and you get some real good detailed feedback from the selection committee or from external reviewers, you're better positioned to revise your proposal and deliver a stronger one. So resubmission is normative. Um, I would say that in the um, field, in the research funding field, it's often um, the case that scholars of color are less likely to reapply. The National Institutes of Health has actually done some work on this um, and found that scholars of color are less likely to resubmit proposals when they're declined. And I would just so especially encourage scholars of color, um, if you think you have a promising application and you can address the concerns that are raised in reviews, to resubmit. Um, don't take yourself out of this grantsmanship game. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's some general tips. Um, it's always helpful to read um, examples of successful proposals. If you know people in your networks who have um, received a scholar's grant, you're welcome to ask them for copies of their proposals. In order to level the playing field, we've also posted a number of successful proposals on our website, and we encourage you to take a look at them. Our program officers have often gone through those proposals and annotated them to try to give you a little more sense of why particular aspects of the proposal were so strong. So we encourage you to look at examples. And they are examples. They're not templates. Please don't copy them. Don't think that if you do everything they did, you'll get a grant. But it is useful. Um, so think about them as resources to help you in your grantsmanship. Obviously, is in undertaking any research, pose important questions and study them rigorously. Um, sometimes early career scholars pose a ton, a very long list of important questions that can't possibly all be answered well um, in a, a five-year program of research. So really try to narrow in on what are the significant questions and then make sure you bring a rigorous plan for studying each of them. Um, as Melissa has already said, write clearly and avoid jargon. We can't say that often enough. There's so much jargon um, in academic writing, and it often doesn't transfer well across disciplines and fields. So to the best of your ability, try to avoid that. The next one tip is about balancing ambition and feasibility. Um, and this is, this is a hard one, especially when you're early in your career to know what's ambitious enough and yet still feasible. Um, I would say this is a great place for mentors to come in and give you some feedback about what seems like um, uh, ambitious enough um, and yet can help you think about what some of the feasibility concerns might be and ways to address them. Um, one common thing that I see is that sometimes people propose in their five-year plans of work to conduct a literature review. So their first stage of work is to conduct a literature review. Um, those proposals never move on in the process because our expectation is you've already conducted a literature review and hence you're able to propose a five-year empirical body of work um, to fill those gaps in the literature. Um, 
And then our last tip is to get two good mentors. Someone asked in the um, question box whether it's better to have one mentor or two mentors. Um, you certainly, it's not a requirement to have two good mentors, but in our experience, given the kinds of stretches and expansion goals that people have, it often takes two men good mentors for folks to get the full range of mentoring that they need. So, you know, there's no ironclad rules here, but that's what we typically see. Next slide, please. Okay, so next I'm gonna break down the tips in terms of key aspects of the proposal. And when you see the scholar's application guide, um, and really, I can't say this enough, really follow that application guide because it's like a template um, in many ways of what we're looking for in different um, aspects of the proposal. Um, so I'm gonna go through them. Let's start with the applicant. Next slide. So when staff and the selection committee look at applicants, they're looking for a promising publication record. If you're um, in a discipline or a field that emphasizes journal articles, that means you at least have a couple of first authored um, uh, journal articles um, behind you. So there's a little bit of a track record of success publishing. If you're in a book um, discipline, there's at least a um, a book out or maybe a book that's very close um, is under contract. Um, you, the committee is also judging whether you are likely to become um, an influential scholar. So again, this is the reason why they're looking for your publication record. Not that you have a huge list of publications, but you have high quality publications um, that suggests that you um, are already on a promising trajectory um, to be an influential scholar. And then again, you know, as Melissa started by saying, this is a career development grant. And so part of that is you have specific learning goals, specific ways in which you're gonna stretch your expertise. And you're really clear on what those are. So you have a clear sense of, here's what my current expertise is, and here's how I need to expand my expertise in order to do more significant. Next slide, please. In terms of the research plan, as I've said before, make sure it's a really good fit with the foundation's research interests. Um, trying to, you know, pigeon, you know, kind of reshape your work so that it fits a funder's priorities often doesn't go very well. Um, so make sure the fit is really there. Um, for us as a foundation, we care a lot about both theory as well as policy and practice relevance. So make sure the questions you're asking in the research are important both for theory as well as they have policy and practice relevant. Um, as with any, any research, make sure you bring strong research designs, methods, and analyses to the table. They map on really well to the questions that you're asking um, so that um, they, you know, certain methods, certain designs are best able to bring ev strong evidence to bear on certain kinds of questions. So make sure that mapping of methods to questions is really tight and well aligned. Make sure your research plan fits your learning goals. So, um, you know, all of these things should map onto each other. Um, so in order to do your five-year research plan, you need to learn, you know, have these learning goals and expand your expertise in X and Y ways. So make sure there's a mapping of that. If you're proposing multiple studies, make sure they're cohesive. They really feel like they are adding up to something. Um, not all uh, of the William T. Grant scholars propose multiple studies. Um, for example, Seth Holmes is an anthropologist um, who proposes one large multi-stage uh, qualitative study in four communities. Um, so it does happen, but others, um, in other disciplines especially, tend to propose multiple studies. And if you do so, make sure they're cohesive. And again, as I've said before, really think about whether in that five-year plan of work, you're balancing ambition and feasibility. Next slide, please. Okay, for your mentoring plan, again, your mentoring plan should map really well onto your learning goals, as well as to the research plan. Um, so all of these parts of the proposal are mapping onto each other very tightly. Uh, make sure you get committed mentors. Um, so people who are really um, invested and committed to working with you and helping you develop your expertise so that you can be successful. Um, the mentors are asked to submit letters um, sort of detailing what they will do and their commitments. And so 
you know, you want to make sure that whoever you ask to be your mentors are people who are really going to be committed to you and talk about it in detail about how they're going to make themselves available to you. And often mentors are very busy. Um, and so have they thought through the time commitment and have shown a willingness to really put it forward. Because it's a grant, we want to make sure the grant adds value to your existing mentoring relationships. So don't propose your dissertation advisor or someone who's already a mentor to you and who's going to mentor you regardless of whether you get this grant. We want this grant to have some additional value to your mentoring relationships. So I encourage people to think broadly about others in the field that they, whose maybe work they admire or they really love to learn from in order to um, meet their learning goals. Um, so make sure you're thinking about who would be good for that. Again, the mentors who you pick, as well as the mentoring plan, fit your learning goals. We've said that over and over again. Um, that it's clear both on what you want to learn. Is it um, a new set of methods? Is it a dis different disciplinary sort of perspective? Say maybe you're an educational psychologist, but you want to learn more from sociological theory about social context and how it matters. You know, really think through what the what and then the how. You know, um, how you learn about disciplinary perspectives is not exactly the same as the best way to learn about methodology methods, methodological expertise. So really think about what is the, the thing you want to learn and what's the best way to learn it. And you and your mentor should develop a plan that fits um, that. Um, the strongest proposals have some indication that the mentoring has already begun. So for example, there's some imprint of the mentor's expertise in the proposal. Um, sometimes you know, the selection committee gets to a proposal and they say, you know, I know this mentor and that mentor's perspective is not reflected in this proposal at all. I don't think she would have recommended X, Y, and Z. And so that's um, a red flag because it suggests, oh, the, the mentor hasn't really looked at the application um, and that imprint is, isn't there. On the converse side, if the letter and the proposal already has some imprint, some reflection of the mentor's influence, um, it's, uh, it gives people more confidence that the mentoring is going to actually happen. It's not just something on paper, um, but that it will be successful. And so this is a safe bet to invest in this scholar and in their mentoring relationships. Next slide, please. Okay, institutional support. Um, so as Melissa mentioned, um, the uh, the scholar applicants have to be nominated by their institution and by uh, a college or the division um, that they're in. So um, one person from the School of Education, for example, could be nominated by their dean. At the same university, someone from the School of Public Health could be nominated by their dean. Um, or maybe if you work at a um, research policy organization like Urban Institute or RAND, um, the division head. Um, nominates one person from that group. And part of that is we want to know that the institution that you work in is really committed to this young scholar. So not just the foundation through a grant is committed, but that the institution itself is also committed to this young scholar's development. Um, and so that institutional support is reflected in whether they provide the infrastructure that you will need to carry out the research. So have they you know, has the dean or, or the academic dean, whoever read the proposal, have a sense of how they're going to provide you with the resources you need to carry out the work? And is the institution committing at least half of your paid time to research? It doesn't have to be research just on the scholar's grant, but it has to be that you have protected time to focus on the research aspects of your career. Um, so that's an important um, indication of uh, institutional support. So with that, that wraps up the formal part of our um, presentation, and we will go to questions. And one way I'm going to do this is I've got it, a list of questions in front of me, and I will um, throw some over to Melissa, and I'll pick a few that I might be able to um, answer myself. Um, so Melissa, here's one question, and it's about our inequality issues. Um, and they ask, you know, 
I think what they're asking is, does it matter what um, uh, scale the inequality is on? Does it have to be inequality that addresses national issues? Can it be in cities or in regions? Does that matter? Um, does it have to have relevance to national policies or federal policies or can relevance to state and local policies um, be sufficient? Sure. Um, thanks for uh, throwing that one my way, Vivian. And so in response to that, I would say, um, uh, yes, that like all of those apply. And so we see um, uh, people or applicants run the gamut in terms of like the level of the level of analysis that they're interested in or like where a policy or practice might emanate. I would say that if you are starting um, with something that is hyper local, it will be helpful in that research plan um, for you to make the case about, you know, this is a case of something more global, of something, if I study this thing that might seem like really, really specific and particular to this one location, it is actually going to illuminate um, some broader theoretical constructs or some broader patterns that uh, will have implications outside of it. And so thinking about, you know, what does your research or how does your research generalize? If it's at, you know, a national level, it's often times easier to think about um, how that generalizes. But if it is at like a smaller level, a more local level, then helping us understand how if the foundation makes this investment in analyzing this problem that um, is situated within Detroit, Michigan right now, how knowing about that is going to like generalize add to a larger conversation. And so I would say that, yes, you can be operating at like different level of um, foci, if you will, but always wanting to make sure in that application that you're helping us understand how your study will illuminate some larger pattern and help us reduce inequality, not just within that one context, but take things from your study and now apply them, shift them, move them to larger levels of analyses. Great, thank you, Melissa. We have a number of questions about reapplication and resubmission. So um, let me throw you a few. Um, you know, what if you do reapply, what feedback is provided to the applicant when they reapply? Um, and do you have to be nominated again by your institution if you're on your reapplication? I will start with the second question. So, yes, you would still need to be um, nominated uh, again from your institution. And so, um, though I would imagine that for most institutions, well, I shouldn't say for most, for some institutions, part of the case you could make is that, you know, look at these reviews that I got. This is how I can see, like how I can update my proposal and have an even stronger case. And so in providing that second part to my answer, that sort of gives you a sense for what you will have um, coming out of the application cycle, even if you don't advance to actually being awarded a grant, you will um, either have um, some feedback from the internal um, WT grant staff. And so in terms of, you know, did you get the message that your uh, project wasn't a fit? And so now how are you gonna make it a fit again? and as um, in this next application cycle. Um, or if you advanced beyond the um, sort of internal selection procedures, again, you will have the reviews from the um, selection committee members. And so what did they tell you? Um, and how are you going to now, you know, shift, rethink, reconfigure components of your application to actually respond to those reviews? If you made it to the finalist stage, and as Vivian mentioned, there have been people who made it to the finalist stage, were not awarded the grant, but then reapply. At that stage, you have a lot of information. You have information from the selection committee member of the reviews, you have information from the external reviews, and you have a sense for how your actual interview went. And so your resubmission statement should be grappling, you know, with all three of those sets of information that you have. And so when you put together your resubmission statement, 
one way to think about it is um, it's a revise and resubmit for those of you who write that, you know, that process is for both journal and book writers that you've gotten some information about what people appreciated about your application, about your candidacy, but also what their, like what remaining concerns do they have? And so as you um, put together a revised application, how are you integrating that material? And how is that material now then reflected in what this new application actually looks like as people are going back through it? And so um, again, just depending on exactly when your application moved out of consideration, you will have access to different information, but either way, you're always going to have access to some information that can help you rethink, reconfigure and revise your application for the next cycle if you choose to. Great, thank you, Melissa. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a break and I'll, I'll throw a question to myself. Um, there are a lot of questions um, here about mentors. Um, so let me let me try to give some some advice about that. Um, so some people are asking whether the mentors should be in the same discipline or different disciplines, whether they can be senior, they have to be senior full professors, or whether they can be um, more mid-career or junior themselves, so maybe more peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Um, so what I would say is this, you know, the most important thing the selection committee may think about is what is the expanded expertise that you're trying to learn and um, who is going to be best positioned to mentor you on that. Now that's sometimes um, someone who is closer to your career level can do that, but there are many times when it's harder for someone who themselves is trying to make their way up the career ladder. Um, they don't yet have maybe the social capital or the social networks to introduce you into a field. Um, they might not yet themselves have mastered how to publish and really craft um, um, a really compelling body of work to really make a difference in something that you're also learning. So it's not to say it's impossible. There are some amazing early and mid-career uh, people out there but I would say, generally speaking, you want to think about who is best positioned to help you meet the specific learning goals um, that you have. Um, uh, in terms of number, um, I've already talked about one versus two. Again, there's no ironclad rules. Certainly people have gotten the award for proposing only one mentor. It's been very convincing that that's all they needed. Uh, most people, though, propose two. Um, that is not to say two mentors are the are all that you need to be successful. Um, and so some people in their proposals will say, you know, I, pro I um, hope to also get some advice from these people because I understand that these are additional things that I need to be successful in this five-year program of work. Or then maybe they set up an advisory committee um, where the role is not quite as intensive as the mentoring role, and yet they still benefit from some advice from other folks in the field. And so that's something you should feel free um, to think about. Um, should the mentors be in the same discipline as you? Um, I Certainly they could be, um, but I would say one of the hallmarks of the scholars program is that it's very interdisciplinary. And so, you know, it's rare that, um, you know, someone applies as a sociologist and really just wants to move one lane over as a sociologist, it doesn't. It just doesn't come across as a very significant stretch. Um, and so, usually, and not always, but often, um, people are stretching in more significant ways. So they're they're taking themselves further afield from their main areas of training. Um, a lot of times, when people propose methodological stretches, they often go along with disciplinary stretches um, because it doesn't have to be the case. Methods don't belong to a discipline. That often um, certain disciplines um, uh, have more um, of a history for certain kinds of methods. So while there's no ironclad rule, again, that the person should be in the same discipline or should not be in the same discipline, I, I, I would encourage people to think um, more ambitiously about what it takes. You know, too often academia is siloed into discipline, and hence knowledge and knowledge production is siloed into discipline. Um, but if you're really focused on important problems 
that uh, for policy, for practice, for the complex societal challenges that young people are facing, it's often useful to bring dis different disciplinary perspectives or fields to the table, bring that full toolkit to the table, methodologically too, to bring more uh, methodological tools to the table to answer the most important questions, rather than to stay constrained within the tools and perspectives of a single discipline. Um, okay, Melissa, let me throw you a set of questions out. Now there's a set of questions about, you know, what kind of institutions should um, applicants come from? Are we really just interested in applicants from R1 institutions? Um, do we care about um, institutions of other, um, other types or public versus private? Can you answer that? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing is it's not the institution type like R1 or R2 or um, historically Black college or Hispanic serving institution. We're interested in getting applicants from scholars um, at all types of institution institutions. I think what's more important is that um, again, you are in a career ladder position where the emphasis is on research. And so thinking about, um, you know, that is the case for people at liberal arts colleges. That's the case for people, again, at HBCUs, at minority serving institutes, um, you know, research one, research two, research three. And so um, as long as you're in a position where research is a clear part of your trajectory, um, then yes, we welcome applications um, from scholars, regardless of the institution that they're at. And again, in thinking about um, putting together a cohort of scholars um, wanting to have, you know, a mix of people is also important, um, not just a mix of people who vary like in their disciplinary perspective, but also thinking about the ways in which the type of institution you comes from can also add um, that sort of perspective that maybe um, you don't get if everyone in the room is from a research one university. Um, and so again, being able to uh, just make the case that the institution you're in um, supports your research and that your research is a big part of your career growth and development within that institution. Great, thank you. Um, you know, there's a related question here, and I think it might be coming, um, it comes up a lot, I see it in applicants who come from um, teaching um, universities. Um, you know, how, how do they demonstrate that they have enough protected time to engage in research, or how does their institution demonstrate that? Sure. I mean, I think that could be demonstrated in a few different ways. And so um, say if you're at a um, teaching institution where it's not really the case that people can be exempted from teaching classes, one way to sort of demonstrate that enough of your time will be dedicated to research could be that you will be exempted from particularly onerous service opportunities or particularly like burdensome service opportunities um, for some amount of time while you are a scholar. And so there are definitely ways in which to think about how can an institution free up a faculty member's time that don't involve um, like stepping outside of the classroom. Um, that could also be providing um, extra time or extra money during the summer. And so you could be proposing instead of, um, you know, the idea that some of the money that you get from the scholars grant is going to be to help you buy out courses. That might not be a possibility if you're at a teaching focused institution, but perhaps you're going to be using part of the money associated with the scholars grant to provide summer salary. Um, and so thinking about the different ways in which an institution can show that they're willing to work with you to ensure that you meet the obligations that matter to that institution, but will also help you establish time and space to conduct research. And so those would be, um, you know, conversations with your department chair, with your dean. Um, when I was at UMass Amherst, even though it, it's an R1 institution, they, they actually do prize teaching. And so being released from courses was actually not always 
possible, but thinking about um, uh, time in the summer or being released from certain service obligations, uh, those were the sorts of negotiations that many of us had to enter into. Great. Um, let's see, there's a set of questions here um, about, uh, again, going back to the foundation's interest. Um, there's a set of questions here about, you know, I'm interested in younger kids from two to eight, or there's another set of questions that's like, I'm interested in more adults from 18 to 40, you know, is there a good fit? So let me try to take that on. Um, because the foundation's focus is on young people ages five to 25, you need to demonstrate that there is a significant center of gravity in this study that's focused on young children or young people in that age range. So, um, and that the work is gonna have policy and practice relevance for young people in that age range. So for example, if the study is about um, the long-term effects of early care and education um, that, um, that, that young children receive, and what are the long-term impacts when they are 10 or 20 years old, that would not be a good fit with the foundation's interest because the policy and practice relevance there is really for early care and education programs. So, but if it's, you know, what is the continuity of supports that um, uh, young children need as they transition um, from early care and education into the K-12 system, that could be a good fit because it it's also has relevance for um, how to design policies, programs, and supports for young children as they move into this age range. Um, Let's see, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, so there's an interesting question here and they're asking for some clarity on what we mean by early career versus a career ladder approach. We keep using the word career to modify different things. So what, what do we mean by that? So they're saying, for example, if someone is an untenured um, uh, associate professor, but within seven years, PhD. Are they eligible to apply? Um, based on that description, I would say yes. And so um, it's less important if you are um, associate or untenured and more important again that um, you are in a position where research is a part of your uh, promotion criteria where the steps in that career or position are clear. And again, that you are within seven years of either having earned a doctorate or if you're an MD seven years of having, within seven years of having completed your residency, your first residency. And so based on that description, that definitely seems as if that is a person who is eligible to apply um, again, if if a deeper conversation or email exchange um, to sort of just clarify that even further would be helpful. That's always the type of question that can come um, to the foundation through you know like the general email that email box that you sort of get to from the website or um, directly to me um, to get more clarity on the particulars of an individual case. Great. Um, so there's another question, which I'll, I'll throw to myself. Um, so there's a question of whether, uh, sometimes we say, does policy slash practice, do we really mean policy? Do we really mean practice? Does the need, does the research need to be relevant to both? Um, the answer to that is it's really policy or practice. Um, and we're not looking, and, and so I just want to say a little bit about what we mean by policy or practice relevant. Um, you know, we're interested in work that has some relevance beyond academic conversations. Um, is it, um, and again, remember our mission is supporting research to improve the lives of young people. And our thinking about that is that research has to be informative um, to policy or to practice in order to affect the conditions that affect young people's lives. Um, and so it's helpful to really think about um, 
you know, if you're doing a study in education, what are the, is it about education policy that you're designing research to inform? Is it more about classroom teachings or something closer to practice? Um, if you're interested in anti-poverty policy, is it, um, or research to inform anti-poverty policy, is it about um, federal policy or is it more about how states administer and set their um, public programs and the eligibility criteria that they set up? Um, or is it something more at the local level, perhaps the county level? So just think through um, what is the, in the particular area that you're interested in, what is the potential policy or practice relevance? And think a bit about how you're designing your research to be informative to those um, policy or practice um, discussions. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, and it, uh, this question has come up in various ways um, and it's about discipline. Um, so one person just says, is this mainly for sociologists? Um, another person asks, uh, do you have a list of disciplines that you have to belong to in order to be eligible to apply? Um, can you talk a little bit about disciplinary um, interests that the foundation has? Sure, it's definitely not just for um, sociologists. I happen to have worked in the sociology department, so a lot of my examples are like sociology specific because I have a lot of them. Um, but in terms of current scholars, um, they represent a number of disciplines. Um, yes, sociology is one. So too is psychology, um, people from higher education. Um, Vivian mentioned someone earlier who was um, anthropology. I do think um, even, you know, once you even like drill deeper down like medical anthropology versus um, other forms of anthropology. And so thinking about um, the key is, does your research fit within um, the foundation's priorities? Um, computer scientists, um, information science scholars, um, medically focused scholars, again, you can have an MD and if you're, you know, in a research position at a um, university um, it, with an MD, you are eligible based on the criteria. And so then thinking about it does what you're researching fit within the foundation's priorities. And so um, scholars run the spectrum of the types of disciplines that are represented in academia. Great, thank you. It looks like we have one minute left. So maybe <laughs> I'll offer um, one final tip. Um, uh, there's been a lot of questions about the fact that you need to be nominated by an, um, your institution and maybe a dean um, or a division head. Um, often that happens in different ways by different institutions. So the foundation just provides a requirement that you have to be nominated by that person. Um, but we don't tell institutions how they come up with those nominations. So some institutions um, have an internal competition that they run. Um, we have a little bit of guidance on our website to help a dean or someone understand the foundation's interest so that they can best run a competition um, that fits, is likely to yield them someone who would be competitive for the scholars program. Um, so it's up to institutions and divisions how they pick who they nominate, but what we try to do on our end is to be very clear about what we're interested in um, and to provide um, real clarity about our uh, criteria for funding. Um, and so that hopefully will help deans or division heads um, figure out who to nominate. And you should all feel free um, as you're communicating to your dean or division head to share that information. And with that, I want to thank all of you for participating in this webinar with Melissa and me today. Um, again, I'll just remind you that this webinar has been recorded and it will be um, available to everyone who signed up uh, next week. So thank you for your interest in the Scholars Program and we will look forward to reviewing your applications.